the inequalities are really around better information, better data. And when we think about food inequality uh, in food systems, we tend to think of outcomes. We tend to think of this, this part of the city is, has bad nutrition outcomes and this part of the city has good, or this region of the country has good and bad, or this country has better than this country. But when you think about malnutrition in all its forms, you know, stunting, wasting, anemia, hypertension, obesity, overweight, you name it, pretty much every country has a, has a massive malnutrition problem. Uh, but almost half of the countries uh, in the world have uh, this double or triple burden where they're dealing with undernutrition as well as rising rates of obesity, diabetes, and overweight. Um, so pretty much every country has, uh, put it another way, no country has a monopoly on the problem, uh, and no country has a monopoly on the solutions. So, but I want to talk about three other kinds of inequality that I think drive a lot of these outcomes. Um, so the organization that I lead is a uh, NGO, nonprofit. It, it specializes in bringing different stakeholders together to come up with solutions in Africa and Asia um, that, that none of them could come up with on their own. We work with governments, um, NGOs, and businesses, and research organizations. So these are the three inequalities. The way we create the demand for healthy food, because if you don't create the demand, um, businesses which comprise essentially most of the food systems, they're not really going to rush in to meet, to meet a non-existent demand. So you have to create a demand or make it easier for people to buy healthier foods. You have to lower the affordability, uh, sorry, make, the, make healthy foods more affordable. Yeah. I'll present some data on that, which I find surprising. And then the environments obviously have to be supportive of making healthy choices. And there's some, some data-related issues there that I want to talk about. Lawrence, we have a little street noise on the side. Yeah, I will speak up. Um, so first of all, the first inequality is how do we create the demand for food? And so you've probably seen this kind of a picture before, left brain, right brain, obviously not very scientific diagram. Um, I tend to be a bit more left brain than right brain. And I think most public sector... Can you hear me okay? Most public sector behavior change programs that try to get people to eat this as opposed to that tend to be very left brain, very linear, logical, evidence driven, data driven. If you do this, it'll be good for you, therefore you should do this. I've got two adolescents, they, they just roll their eyes when I tell them about, you know, why are you eating that, you should be eating this. Uh, I, of course, the businesses are brilliant at the right brain stuff, at getting us to consume things we don't really need and actually didn't even think we needed to, and we don't need. Uh, and they will use um, aspiration, emotion, um, uh, colors. They will, they will make the food uh, sexy, not to, to use a, a kind of a crude term for it. And when I, I go to lots of nutrition conferences um, and I, I hear the words affordability, availability, access, palatability, but I never hear the words desirability. I never hear the words delicious. I never hear the word craving. And so again, is our organization is trying to merge these two types of approaches to come up with hybrid ways of creating the demand for healthy food. And we've done some, I think, really creative work in Indonesia uh, around, around this kind of thing. So that's the first set of evidence-based, you know, it's, it's kind of going beyond the, the survey evidence to, to, to key into other kinds of uh, evidence is about why, why people buy and choose the foods they do. The second inequality is about who can afford a healthy diet. And um, it's actually really hard to, it's, it's really unusual to get price data uh, in, in, in lots of African and Asian countries, especially for people who buy foods who are not in supermarkets or big retail outlets. I buy it from the local markets. It's difficult. Not many people collect this data on a routine basis. So whenever I see a new study coming out, this came out in Lancet Global Health, I get excited. Uh, so this is a study from uh, India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, and Zimbabwe. I don't know why it was those four countries. Uh, nationally representative data. And they ask a very basic, one of the things they do is ask a very basic question. How much income would it take a, an average household in those countries to buy five fruits and vegetables a day? So we can probably all buy 10, 20, 30 fruits and vegetables a day if we wanted to. But it turns out it costs these households 52% of their household income to buy fruits and vegetables that are readily available in those geographies, in those contexts. So clearly, some of the things we were talking about this morning in the plenary is just not 
it's out, of, it's out of the realms of possibility for some of the households uh, in, in Asia and Africa. Um, one of the things that GAIN does is try to work with small and medium enterprises uh, to lower the, the price of food. And th I just wanted to share this with you. This is a picture from uh, one of the companies we work with in Mozambique. Um, and I said, what's that on the wall? And he said, that's our mission statement. And I said, OK, tell me more. He said, the managing director said, the first, the top thing is the price we currently can sell at to make a sort of a 5% margin. Uh, and the arrow at the bottom is the price we'd like to sell at because we want to reach a bigger uh, customer base. Uh, and I said, what's the triangle? And he said, that's the pyramid. And we want to get to people at the bottom of the pyramid. And so there are lots of companies that you don't have to change the, what they want to do because they're already producing fruits, vegetables, uh, uh, fish, nuts, seeds, that kind of stuff. We just have to help them um, make their food more available and affordable and, and actually desirable. And I think the third inequality I want to talk about before I finish is there's a real asymmetry of information about business and nutrition. The worlds I come from are sort of the undernutrition uh, Africa, Asia, Latin America world. And in that world, uh, business, the idea of business and nutrition is a highly contentious um, business. So this is my, what did you call it? Um, what did you call the slide? <laughs> the Dukes of Hazard slide. Dukes of Hazard slide. <laughs> Any of you f are familiar with American TV from the 80s will call this the Dukes of Hazard. But the, this is an HSBC ad. You've seen these ads. Any of you who travel around, get on planes and things. And they have the same picture three times, but with three different labels because different pictures connote different things to different people. Uh, and it's all about how you see the world. And it, uh, in, the, in the communities I work with, um, there's, there's sort of three pre prevailing views. One is business can do no wrong when it comes to improving nutrition. Businesses are smarter, they are more efficient, they've got better scale, they just kind of know everything, they're just better. Everything they do is better. The public sector is useless. Then there's a group who says business really has no business in nutrition. Um, governments should do everything. Uh, and of course, this is not sustainable at all because businesses are intimately involved in nutrition, whether it's purchasing food through markets, purchasing drugs, purchasing water, uh, purchasing sanitation materials. So businesses are heavily involved. And it's this middle ground um, that every, I think everybody, most people are there. That's certainly where I am. When and how to engage with businesses to advance nutrition. Um, which groups, which products, which markets, which geographies, which businesses, uh, and which NGOs. And the reason I'm putting that up here is that this, this big area in the middle is a silent majority. And these, these two polarities are allowed to succeed because there's very little evidence about what works in the public private space for advancing nutrition and healthy food choices. There's a ton out there on health. Uh, public private partnerships and health are very well evidenced and evaluated, but very little. So engage. Um, to build that enabling environment, but do it with your wide, eyes wide open. But the key, the key message for this audience today is measure the impact of actions. I've been on so many panels with business leaders uh, who say we're doing this fantastic work that's really improving the nutrition status of these, these people in this community of Nigeria. And I say, great, where can I find out more about it? They say, go to the website. So I go to the website and I find just a bit of PR fluff and there's no, there's no document that says that actually this works. Um, my final slide is this one, which asks the question, how much food is needed to feed the world in 2030? 2030 is when the SDGs end. We see this question a lot. I think it's actually, and you know, hamburgers and rice will, will if you make them affordable and available enough, they will do that. They will, they will help feed the world. But this is the wrong question. The right question is, how do we nourish the world and how do we do it now? Because that's, that's a really global question. And it's a question that every country is facing. And the SDGs are for all countries, unlike the MDGs, the Millennium Development Goals. Uh, the SDGs don't say there's an us and them, and we will help you to get better. The SDG says we all have a problem, and we all need to come up with solutions. So we need to find new ways to create demand for healthy diets, new ways to support businesses to meet that demand, and new ways for governments to create the environment to enable it. Thanks.